we um, had another important caucus discussion uh, earlier today where we were um, briefed by Representative Adam Schiff uh, on legislation that we expect to vote on in the next day or two uh, that relates to the effort to defend our democracy. And of course, we continue to try to work to deliver real results for the American people, solve the challenges that are in front of us uh, as we continue to do, making sure that we avoid a default on our debt, protect the full faith and credit of the United States of America, ensure that we've got a robust defense infrastructure in place uh, to protect the safety and well-being of the American people, and continue to support President Biden's efforts uh, to crush the virus, to make sure that we're providing real relief to the American people who have been struggling through this pandemic, and also to deliver millions of good paying jobs to everyday Americans, cut taxes as we did with the child tax credit, and will continue to do through the Build Back Better Act, and perhaps most importantly at this moment, to lower costs for everyday Americans. The Build Back Better Act uh, will lower child care costs, it will lower health care costs, uh, it will lower the cost of housing, it will lower higher education costs, and it's going to lower the high cost of life-saving prescription drugs, including but not limited to insulin. Democrats deliver for the people. Making life better for working families, middle class folks, senior citizens, low income families, young people, veterans, the poor, the sick, the afflicted, the least, the lost, and the left behind. Democrats deliver for everyday Americans. And it would be a nice thing if we actually had partners in government willing to work with us on the challenges facing the American people. But we do not. It's not hyperbole. It's not rhetoric. It's not spin. It's what the other side is telling us. They are telling us who they are. Marjorie Taylor Greene was very clear. For all of the world to hear, she said, we all need to hear this. So we're helping her out in that regard. We conservatives in the House GOP aren't the fringe. We're not the fringe. Oh, that's interesting. We actually represent the base of Republican voters approximately 70%. And when the party, presumably Kevin McCarthy and company, learn to represent conservative Americans, we will never lose again. They are the base. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> if we thought that Marjorie Taylor Greene was an outlier, this week we hear from Matt Gates. It's very clear what the American people can expect if things go the way that Matt Gates apparently believes they're going to go. He says, when we're going to take power after the next election, and when we do, it's not going to be the days of Paul Ryan and Trey Gowdy, two people that I can agree to disagree with on a variety of issues but have a lot of respect for in the contest of ideas. And certainly my friend Trey Gowdy is no shrinking violet. Served with him on the Judiciary Committee. A worthy opponent, the two of them. And he says it's going to be the days of Jim Jordan, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Dr. Gosar, and myself. What a group. What a group. The base of the Republican Party. Conspiracy theorists, QAnon supporters, and wannabe authoritarian sympathizers intent on destroying our democracy. 
in their words, not ours. And so we're going to continue to keep the focus on delivering for the American people. But this is frightening stuff. With an Omicron variant that we're trying to crush, inflationary issues that we're trying to deal with connected to the pandemic and supply chain dynamics, and of course the defense of our democracy, and this is what we're hearing from the leaders of the House Republican Conference. And I yield to my good friend, Pete Aguilar. Thank you, Professor Jeffries. I, uh, this is, this is shocking stuff and, uh, and to see what our colleagues here are saying is just deeply troubling. Um, but as the chairman mentioned, we're focused on the agenda at hand. Last week we passed a continuing resolution uh, to fund government through February. This week we passed the National Defense Authorization Act uh, to protect our men and women in uniform to make sure that they have the resources uh, to continue uh, to do the job. Uh, we passed legislation to protect Medicare and working uh, with the Senate to come up with a deal uh, to prevent what would be a catastrophic debt default. For four years, the former president's reckless policies added nearly $8 trillion to the national debt with nothing to show for it. The U.S. has never defaulted on our debt and we won't start now. As always, House Democrats are focused on working for the people, while our colleagues on the other side threaten violence and spew racist rhetoric at our members. And as we've said before, these halls don't always feel safe for members. Uh, and this season, as this season, uh, as this year comes to an end, it's important to reflect that the GOP leader needs to step up, hold his members accountable, and ensure that we can all do the work that we need to do while agreeing to disagree occasionally. It's important that we have uh, the space uh, to make those decisions and that members feel comfortable uh, doing the job uh, that we need to do. With that, uh, we'll answer some questions. Well, I don't, I don't want to comment on what leadership's position is. Everyone can speak for themselves. I think um, people have been very clear uh, in their support of the White House, e the White House's efforts in this regard. Certainly, President Biden has been very clear um, that he's going to provide all the help that any cities, jurisdictions, or municipalities may need uh, in dealing with any outbreaks of property crimes or violence or anything that threatens the health, the safety, and well-being of the American people. And I stand with the administration in that regard. And then will leadership need to strip Representative Bobart of the committee? Yeah, I didn't get an opportunity to def attend the leadership meeting yesterday because I was at the funeral for the late uh, Carrie Meek. Uh, but it is my expectation that Lauren, Lauren Bobert is going to be held accountable as Vice Chair Aguilar mentioned, um, it would be a constructive thing if my friends on the other side of the aisle would handle their own business in terms of the out of control members. But we haven't seen that level of accountability so far. At some point, I think the House as a whole is going to have to act. Well, I think if we weren't receiving information that is helpful to the investigation, then that could be a speed bump. 
but we continue to gather information each and every day. Over 270 interviews uh, that we've conducted, uh, we continue to, to glean information uh, from witnesses each and every day and to connect the investigative dots that are necessary. Uh, you know, clearly, as you mentioned, if, if Mr. Bannon wants to potentially go to jail for, for two years as a result of not talking to us, um, then that's something he's going to have to answer to. I would love if it was in a more expedited manner, um, uh, as, as would my colleagues, um, but that's the path he's chosen. Um, but I will say, for every individual, it's a small group of individuals who are stonewalling the investigation that we're having. Um, and for every one of them, there's dozens more who are talking to us. Uh, and there continues to be data and information that, that we gather that helps our investigative needs. And I'd just refer you to the chairman's letter to um, Mr. Meadows' attorney uh, that, that became public uh, this morning that talks about uh, some of that information that we've already received from from Mr. Meadows himself in part of the six thousand documents uh, that we've that we've seen. And on the pleading with this, that's it. Is that stalling, or do you think these people are actually interested? We we have deep reverence for for the Fifth Amendment, um, uh, and and want to make sure that we're proceeding cautiously when so, when someone does that, when someone uh, invokes the Fifth Amendment. Um, so we don't take that lightly at all. Uh, so that's part of the the discussion, and that will be part of. Um, uh, potentially, you know, an interview um, that someone has with us, if they choose to invoke their Fifth Amendment right, uh, then that's something that would be for the record. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can't come before uh, the committee. There is no blanket um, uh, privilege and there is no blanket uh, fifth. So uh, if they want to handle it on a question by question basis, uh, that's something that, uh, that the committee um, is willing to have a conversation about, but that shouldn't forestall our efforts. Thank you, Merle. On the child tax credit, do you think the House should proactively renew the CTC in case the Senate doesn't pass the Build Back Better Act before the end of the year? And will Senator Phillips be cut? Yes, yeah, my <laughs> expectation that the Senate is going to act uh, and get the Build Back Better Act over the finish line prior to the end of the year. Majority Leader Schumer recently reiterated that commitment. One of the reasons why it's important uh, is because of the pending expiration of the child tax credit, which has been um, a lifeline for so many different American families, low-income families, working families, uh, and middle-class families, helping to provide families in America at a time when we are seeing some inflationary pressures uh, to pay for child care expenses or educational expenses or food or housing expenses. Uh, that's a democratic initiative that we support that has been important uh, and critical uh, and that we are determined to make sure continues. Just follow up on that though, is there a plan if Build Back Better doesn't get signed into law by the time that this current one expires and could that become a political problem for you guys given how much you've touted the expansion of this credit as one of the ways that you are doing things for you know voters? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll yield to Pete as well on this uh, question who's played an important role uh, as an appropriator in this space. But, and of course, we're all thankful for the leadership of Chairwoman Rosa DeLauro. And I don't think that Chairwoman DeLauro is going to allow this tax credit to expire. And House Democrats will not allow this tax credit to expire. And I don't believe that the Senate uh, will either. President Biden, when he came to visit us, was very clear uh, in what he outlined in the House Build Back Better Act that had support in the Senate. And amongst the many things that he laid out, of course, the child tax credit uh, was right at the top of the list. It's my expectation that this is going to get done and that the Build Back Better Act is going to get done. Yeah, go back to this side and then we'll go back to the other side. Yeah. Yeah, I don't believe that there's any uh, hesitancy. There are active discussions about the appropriate way to proceed. And I think you are now seeing 
at least some rank and file House Republicans, um, including most recently Representative Crenshaw, indicate that this is a toxic circus that is going on on the other side of the aisle. And something needs to be done about it. Hopefully, the House Republican leadership will come to that conclusion as well. Uh, but there is no hesitancy on our side. We've held members accountable in the past. We think that it is the House's collective responsibility to act. Democrats continue to be prepared to do that. It's unclear what's happening on the other side of the aisle with leadership. Yeah, I don't want to get out ahead of any ongoing discussions in terms of what accountability may ultimately look like, but there are active discussions underway. Good. Um, watching the Republicans did release a report on the jail conditions for rioters, I'm just wondering if, if you think Democrats on the January 6th committee should visit the jail as part of the investigation. The Department of Justice is uh, the entity who that question should be um, you know, sent to, and, you know, we trust that they are carrying out uh, their duties and responsibilities to uphold the rule of law. Uh, there have been a number of criminal prosecutions. Um, you know, we are focused on uh, the events and circumstances that led up to and, and caused uh, January 6th. And so that continues to be our focus, uh, our mission, and our, and our legislative mandate uh, that was passed within House Resolution 503. So uh, that's that's the focus of, of our legislative efforts. Uh, that's what we uh, had uh, bipartisan support for, and that's what we continue to implement. And it's just, it's just kind of, I'll go to you next, but it's kind of extraordinary that we are in the midst of working to create millions of good paying jobs for everyday Americans. We are cutting taxes for working families, and we're lowering costs in a variety of areas, including child care, health care, and the high cost of life-saving prescription drugs. And the most prominent voices within the House Republican Conference are concerned about coddling insurrectionists. Now, I've been involved in prison reform efforts, and I support the notion that, one, people are innocent until proven guilty, and that jail conditions shouldn't be punitive at all. But it's not clear to me that this is a serious effort. Yeah, we just had a question on the NDAA. And, and, you know, Republicans are basically saying it's great to work with them on be able to pass this National Defense Authorization Act, but they're claiming that Democrats and Speaker Pelosi are not working with them to deal with inflation, to deal with more higher gas prices. Your, your reaction to that? Well, the pr uh, and I'll yield to Pete on this as well. President Biden has taken decisive action uh, in terms of the strategic oil reserve release that is designed to ease some of the gas price pressures that the American people are experiencing. There are also geopolitical issues and challenges related to the Gulf states uh, that I believe the Biden administration is trying to deal with. Uh, in order to address gas prices. We don't have um, support from our colleagues on the other side of the aisle in terms of any serious proposals because they're focused on lecturing us, as Marjorie Taylor Greene did, on what the Republican base actually is and spiking the football 12 months before a midterm election, telling us basically to expect nothing but investigations and subpoenas and, in all likelihood, the impeachment of someone from the Biden administration without any reasonable basis or cause. This is what the Republicans are telling us. That's their governing strategy and philosophy. They're not seriously trying to deal with the cost pressures that the American people are experiencing, because if they were, then they'd come forward with some ideas and work with us in terms of the Build Back Better Act. They are not. All I would add is uh, within NDAA, uh, Alyssa Slotkin uh, authored some bipartisan amendments related to the supply chain um, as well. So, so even in the even in the legislation that we are passing, we continue to address uh, issues of importance to members, 
Uh, clearly, the military has a lot of experience um, and a lot of knowledge of the supply chain uh, issues, and so imparting some of that on the broader economy is something that um, uh, that the House Armed Services Committee uh, wanted to convey and, and did that in a, in a bipartisan way. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, back to the January 6th committee, you heard that the criminal referrals were meant in part to deter uh, others from stonewalling. Just, you know, given the fact that after Steve Bannon, you've had Director Cronin not exactly compliant, and now you have Mark Meadows, uh, does it show that that deterrence part is not actually working? No, I'd reject that completely. We've heard from a number of of the attorneys of individuals who we have spoken to, uh, clearly. Uh, we've heard from some counsel that have said specifically, my client is not Steve Bannon. And so, you know, we know that this is uh, something that individuals uh, don't take lightly, uh, and clearly their counsel doesn't take it lightly. Uh, like I said, over 270 uh, witnesses who have come forward, um, and we continue to gather uh, information. It is an incredibly small number of individuals who uh, have indicated they're going to um, claim privilege or otherwise stonewall our efforts, uh, and they will have consequences to those to those actions. But we continue to gather information, as evidenced by the the chairman's uh, letter um, to uh, Mr. Meadows' attorney that was released this morning. Any final questions? Well, I think, you know, the House is on record in a bipartisan way as a result of the impeachment of former President Trump the second time uh, that the President of the United States engaged in inciting a violent insurrection that we all saw with our own eyes, the storming of the Capitol, an assault on police officers, resulting in more than 140 being seriously injured and subsequently some loss of life amongst officers. And it was an effort on January 6 to halt the peaceful transfer of power. To me, that's an insurrection. Now, if my Republican colleagues want to spend uh, their time not dealing with inflation, not dealing with COVID, not dealing with the effort to create millions of good paying jobs, then that's on them. And the choice between what Democrats are all about in delivering with a party of opportunity and what Republicans are all about, they are the party of Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, Dr. Gosar, and Lauren Boebert. I'll take that contrast any day. Thank you, everyone.